have hit the unemployment line since the crisis began and more than anyone reopening the economy will be for them. The Prime Minister and Premiers are working towards a July deadline and on Friday will reveal which restrictions are to be lifted or eased. Here's political editor Andrew Proben. Flattening the curve has saved countless lives but destroyed livelihoods. We now need to get a million Australians back to work. That is the curve that we need to address. Those million Australians were lost from the workforce in just four terrible weeks. Businesses put into hibernation. As long as these restrictions are in place, they are costing our economy some $4 billion a week. That's weighing on the minds of the nation's leaders as they chart a path out of the crisis. That certainly puts an enormous pressure, as it should, on the timetable as we seek to move Australia back to a COVID-safe economy. To get there, guidelines are being developed on a workplace-by-workplace workplace basis. Whether they are a manufacturer or an abattoir or a cafe. But reactivating the economy is a cautious business. Social distancing rules to remain for months to come, even if other restrictions are lifted. We are in a great place, but we cannot risk this great place that we're in. Some hospitality groups are expected to strongly encourage patrons to download the COVID Safe app, although they cannot by law require it. Five million Australians have already done so, an uptake that will help guide National Cabinet on which shutdowns should end first. It's our hope that uh, where we get to on Friday can sort of lay out a mo much more of the roadmap for Australians so they can see what's happening in the weeks and the months ahead. COVID-19 will be with us for many months, if not years to come. So learning to live with it as safely as possible is the only viable long-term option. The PM and Premiers want this new normal to be in place by July, in time for the school holidays. By then, the land of the long white cloud may be open as a destination, even if the border remains closed to other countries. We both stand to benefit from getting travel up and running again. We're working cooperatively together. New Zealand has a, a stronger uh, biosecurity and, and border arrangements, as do we, and so it's the obvious place to start. The rest of the world can wait. Andrew Proben, ABC News, Canberra. Well, the scale of the coronavirus impact on Australia's hotel and restaurant scene has been set out by the Bureau of Statistics. A third of hospitality workers have lost their jobs since mid-March, with both young and old carrying the burden. Alana Dawes has played at the Sydney Opera House and Carnegie Hall. Right now, she should be playing in Helsinki. Instead, she's navigating the Centrelink website. I've never engaged with Centrelink before. I've never had to previously, so it's a, a whole new game for me. The arts has been one of the worst hit sectors, second only to hospitality. That's a double whammy for A.D. Haynes, who works in cafes, when she's not working as a sound technician at the Adelaide Festival Centre. You might have a gap for like four weeks wait before you're do jumping onto another show. Um, so I would contact my boss at Pony and & Co and be like, I've got four weeks free, um, do you have any work for me? And then she would just chuck me on the roster. The Australian Bureau of Statistics has looked at tax office figures and the numbers are grim for those in hospitality. A third of jobs in the accommodation and food services sector have disappeared since mid-March, with Victoria and South Australia the worst hit. More than a quarter of staff in arts and recreation are also out of work, while essential services, finance and insurance jobs are holding up. Those worst affected are hospitality workers aged in their 20s or more than 70. More than 40% of workers in those categories have lost their jobs and those who remain have had a big drop in wages. Economists say returning that curve to normal will take time, even if businesses reopen soon. Lots of people have taken a hit to their income or lost their jobs, so maybe looking to uh, pay off debt or boost savings instead of spending. So it's going to be a slow road out. A slow road to an uncertain future. Leah McLennan, ABC News, Adelaide. Australia has recorded over two dozen new coronavirus cases today, most of them in Victoria. 11 of the 17 Victorian cases are linked to a cluster at a Melbourne abattoir. 42 workers from Cedar Meats have now tested positive, along with three other people who'd been in close contact with an infected worker. The Meatworks has been shut down for two weeks and all of its 350 staff have now been tested for the virus. 
I have to say, has been expertly controlled uh, by the Victorian Health Department with very, very extensive tracing of contacts, isolation and quarantine. The Meatwork says it followed all the guidelines for preventing the virus. Meanwhile, a 16th resident has died after contracting coronavirus at the New March Aged Care home in Western Sydney. An agency worker has also been stood down following allegations that infection controls were breached. Three more staff there have tested positive, as well as someone working for the Nepean Blue Mountains Local Health Authority. The coronavirus crisis continues at Newmarch House. Another death and another three staff infected. An infectious disease expert is now on site to try to work out how the virus is still spreading. He's quite confident the procedures are being put in place and that we haven't seen cases in the residents. Anglicare, which runs Newmarch House, has stood down an agency aged care worker over alleged breaches of infection controls. It's not known if they were the cause of the three new infections. What's clearly gone wrong is that there's an issue around infection control, there's an issue around resourcing and there's an issue around communication. One message that is getting through is the economic shock we can expect. New analysis of ABS data shows the CBD and Mascot Council areas are likely to be among the worst hit, as are Cumberland and Fairfield, with their local economies expected to shrink by up to 12.5%. The industries suffering the most are definitely retail and hospitality. They've had a reduction in business uh, of around 70 to 80%. There's absolutely no foot traffic coming through and we've seen a lot of um, unemployment uh, rise due to that. The Southern Highlands is predicted to suffer the worst downturn in the state by as much as 15%. Stimulating the economy will be key. The state government is investing in new prototype ventilators being built in Sydney and Newcastle. Oh, I do like the fact that beyond a certain point in time we'll be able to rely on our own local uh, high expertise, our own local ma manufacturing supply chains to be able to provide these ventilators. Here at the Westmead Children's Hospital, staff will take part in a coronavirus vaccination trial thanks to a $10 million donation by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Kathleen Calderwood, ABC. ABC News, Sydney. A health official has broken down while giving evidence at the inquiry into the Ruby Princess debacle. The hearing was told there was a failure to update the ship's log of sick passengers before people were let off in Sydney. The revelation comes as Carnival Cruise Line announced plans to resume sailing out of North America in three months. Jim Hamilton's holiday on the Ruby Princess led to a three-week stay in hospital with COVID-19. There was a 70% chance they wouldn't come out of there, which is a scary thought. But the Lake Macquarie pensioner says he wants to be back on deck and already has two cruises booked. Where can you get a holiday for $120, $150 a day? Carnival Cruise Line plans to resume services in North America in August, but in Australia a voluntary freeze will continue until at least September. Mr Hamilton is one of more than 600 people whose coronavirus infection is linked to the Ruby Princess. It's also been tied to at least 21 deaths. Nearly 3,000 passengers were allowed to disembark in Sydney in March after the ship was classified as low risk despite signs of illness. A public inquiry has heard fewer people on board were tested for COVID-19 than influenza. The Commissioner Brett Walker SC called it a reprehensible shortcoming from New South Wales Health. Myself and my colleagues at the Public Health Unit were working very hard on this. We did what we could. And if we could do it again, it would be very different. The inquiry heard the ship's low-risk category was based on an outdated log of illness on board. By the time it docked, the number of sick passengers and crew should have pushed it into a higher-risk category and triggered state government intervention. The Federal Agricultural Department has told a Senate Select Committee it was aware of 128 ill passengers arriving on the ship in Sydney, but it was told by New South Wales Health there were no issues preventing disembarkation. Jamie McKinnell, ABC News, Sydney. Racial abuse against Australia's Asian community has been on the rise since the coronavirus pandemic began. While it's been condemned by all levels of government, there are concerns the number of attacks may be underreported. This is the moment shop owner Jennifer Lee is attacked after standing up for customers being racially abused outside her store. 
it's left her shaken. Do I feel safer now? Because every time when I leave the shop, I still need to like look around and make sure there's no any suspicious things happening. The Australian Human Rights Commission has reported an increase in racist attacks this year. At least a quarter of victims say they were targeted due to coronavirus. But there is concern that many people don't know how or where they should report racial abuse. The lack of understanding and lack of awareness of the legislation means that, 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 that we find ourselves in situation, the situation where we are now is under-reporting. Victims of racial abuse can make a complaint to the Human Rights Commission, but experts say the process is complicated, and this often makes it hard to come forward. It is important to realise that there are real issues that can cause significant toll on your mental and physical health. Federal and state governments have strongly condemned the spate of recent attacks and urged Australians to call out racism when they see it. We've also got to be very clear in separating people's views about the Chinese government, the Communist Party of China, and Australians or permanent residents here who may be ethnically Chinese. Australian Chinese did not cause um, COVID-19, did not have anything to do with it. In fact, Australian Chinese are just like all Australians. We are in it together. While many members of the Asian community say they are scared by the attacks, they are also buoyed by those who are speaking out and offering help. There's a lot of people actually helped me and give me advice on how to deal with these things. There's a lot of them, and they're all they're all Australian. Jason Fang, ABC News. There have been emotional reunions in Italy and Spain as millions of citizens begin venturing outside for work and socialising for the first time since March. Strict rules are still in place to curb the spread of COVID-19, but families are now able to visit one another in the hope that the worst of the deadly outbreaks are over. In Rome, reunions in the sunshine have been months in the making. Across Italy, grandparents who've been alone since February are finally able to see their grandchildren. During the quarantine, we were desperate. Now I can't even speak for how excited I am. When I saw her, my heart stopped. It seemed to be a century since I have seen her. The pandemic has killed almost 30,000 Italians, but with the daily death rate at its lowest in months, a weary nation is reawakening. Today is the first day. It's a good experience. We hope it'll continue in this way, with people not getting sick. Manufacturing and construction businesses are the first to return to work. Spain, too, is gradually easing weeks of onerous restrictions. We crave neighbourhood shops opening again. We want normality back. On some Spanish islands, bars and restaurants are opening their doors, but tourists are being tested on arrival. In Moscow and St Petersburg, the race is on to construct makeshift hospitals. Vladimir Putin has extended the lockdown in his country for another week. And the mayor of Moscow believes a quarter of a million people could have the virus in that city alone. The worst may still be ahead in Russia as the rest of Europe tries to find its way out. Bridget Brennan, ABC News.